Good evening to everyone. My name is Brother Edwin Robinson. I'm past master of New Rock 167 here in Little Rock, Arkansas, under the jurisdiction of the Supreme Council of Louisiana. Okay, see, look, everybody's coming in now. All right, but anyway, uh, hello. Hello. Brother Little John, Pennsylvania. Yeah, we. We're freezing our ass all up here. We freeze. Mute your mic. Hold on, we're in the process of starting uh, the presentation. All right, we're going to mute Brother Paul and Kevin. All right. Sorry about that, guys. I had to mute those mics. Once again, uh, good evening. I'm Brother Robson of New Rock 167 here in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. And uh, I'm in the jurisdiction of the Supreme Council of Louisiana. And uh, first of all, we want to thank everybody for uh, being with us tonight and being a part of this uh, this educational series. We are on our second installment. And... Um, Tonight we're discussing the country, the controversial Grand Constitution, and uh, we have we have uh, brother Paul and brother Kevion who's gonna do a presentation on it, and uh, we're gonna start off with brother Rogers if he wanna uh, do his introduction presentation presentation. And keep in mind also we're gonna have uh, we're gonna let both of them speak, and then uh, after after both have spoken, then we'll take questions and allow y'all guys to uh, interact with the speakers. Kevin, you can unmute your mic. All right, mic's unmuted. All right, good right, evening. Go. So, um, basically, with my presentation, it actually was a uh, a little different, but. Very uh, originally it was going to actually be on the aprons, uh, the red apron, but uh, because of the constitutional aspect of it, uh, you know, I'm gonna tie those uh, two points together. So, um, basically, uh, according to uh, Alan Bernheim, uh, the 1862, I mean, 1762 Constitution of the Princes of Jerusalem was actually originally based off of the 18, I mean, 1761 Constitutions of the Grand Lodge of France, right? Because that's where he was uh, coming out of. And then when you look at the Boileau uh, manuscript, I believe that's from uh, 1763, the following year, you can see like there's a direct con uh, continuity between the actual French constitutions into what would become the ancient accepted Scottish Rite, uh, at least through the, uh, you know, Prince's Jerusalem Constitution, which is the basis of the Order of the Royal Secret. Now, prior to all of that going on, um, when you look at the, the Abrams and stuff, so back in like uh, 1733, the Scots Master Lodge is first mentioned in London, okay? And then in um, 1740, there's a mention of it in France. Um, you know, and that wasn't like really a big deal until a book, was uh, published called The Perfect Mason. And that was like in 1744. But uh, prior to that, um, the Count of Claremont, he was elected the 11th of December, uh, 1743 in succession of his uncle, the Duke of Antin. And then um, he actually mentions specifically the Scots master in the 20th article of those uh, uh, general uh, ordinances. And he was basically saying is that Oh, well, he first mentions is that uh, the describes what's the reality you're going to be for the Grand Lodge, but he says that because of uh, these people who claim Scots Masters has these extra powers that are unknown to us, that they weren't going to actually uh, officially recognize Scots Masters as part of the degree series of Freemasonry at that time. But um, then two years later, he reverses his position 
And then he formally recognizes the Scots master as part of the, the Greece sequence of uh, the Grand Lodge of France. You know, so, and in that same uh, constitution, he also actually uh, changes. So the original translation of the Anderson constitution that they had translated to France was actually uh, the 1738. And then uh, their version of it, they actually said that you have to be a baptized Christian to be a Mason. Uh, and so we look at the Swedish rite, the Zinnendorf, and also the rectified Scottish rite, you know, how they claim that you have to be a Christian to become a Mason. They, that's because their constitutions are actually based off of those earlier French constitutions, okay? So going forward to like the very next year, 1745, we see in the statues of, of the respectable law St. John of Jerusalem, that they recognize the hierarchy of seven degrees and also to become a venerable master, which is the French version of a worshipful master. You actually had to be a Scots master now just to become a worshipful master of a lodge. And then their sequence of 1745, you have apprentice, companion, master, perfect master, master Ireland days, which is um, another name for provost and judge, um, master Elu, which is also known as the elect of the nine, and then the final, the highest grade was uh, Master Ecoze, or, you know, Scots Master. Okay, so during that same time frame in uh, 1745 in Bordeaux, we actually have uh, where Moran was at, they actually chartered a Scots Master Lodge. And then at that lodge, they added set on three new degrees, um, Secret Master, uh, Intimate Secretary, also known as Master by Curiosity, and Intendant of the Buildings, uh, or Intendant des Batiments, which is a uh, master anglais to the so they increase the degrees of the parish system to make a 10 degree system and then that is the nucleus of what became the right of perfection in the logic perfection okay because um and what's interesting with this system is that that would actually be transmitted to new orleans with like um consulate mason um and three other lodges that were there from basically 1750 up until 1763 you know so another is that original version of the um, right of perfection actually was like uh, early worked in Louisiana, okay? And then so, and also what's very interesting too is that because Freemasonry was outlawed in 1763, you know, by the time that the uh, 1762 constitution and also the 1763 was brought down to Haiti, you know, that system had actually didn't make it to Louisiana in that time frame and stuff. So they were still working with their earlier, uh, you know, perfect uh, right of perfection. Okay, so in 1757, um, the Knights of the East are recognized by the uh, Grand Lodge of France. And then that's where you get the, um, the colors for the, uh, for the Grand Lodge representatives would have been um, basically like a, a ribbon like your your collar and then the psalter of uh, ribbon and your apron was going to be uh, basically a color orange and bordered with green because remember the knights of the east uh their apron is a green color you know so what they just did was added that orange you know to make it differentiate um a grand officer from um you know for some somebody who's a regular knight of the east all right and then so then following that you have the 1767 Constitution of Perfect Sincerity at Marseille. And why that's important is because Perfect Sincerity, they were the one who gave the provincial um, provisional uh, charter to uh, uh, Etoile Polaire in New Orleans. You know, so the, the charter uh, was first granted to them in 1796, but they didn't because of, you know, boats and all that stuff. They didn't get it until two years later in 70. Um, what was it? Uh, 1798, and then um, you know, due to the French Revolution, you know, they actually didn't get an official charter and installation from the Grand Orient until like 1803. But besides all of that, um, in 22nd of August 1777, at the 57th, 52nd Assembly of the Grand Orient, they actually, um, you know, in the they actually describe what is um, going to be the official apron for an installed master. And it's basically the apron of a master at Cose. In fact, it was, um, 
it was in the uh, Article 15th of that assembly uh, in the constitutions um, decided upon there. And so basically it was going to be, um, you know, a red apron, but they actually said the apron is the color of fire. And the reason why it's chosen to be a color of fire because that was the color of the Ori flam. The Ori fam is like uh, the flag of France's like military when they go into war, you know, so that's actually was the official color for somebody who which you would consider as a past master, you know, and then in um, December of no I'm sorry. Uh, during March. So March the 2nd of 1804. Uh, the Supreme Council of France, you know, the General Grand Lodge at Cosé of France and the Grand Orient, they merged with each other, okay? So, and then the, the provisions that they decided upon in there is for, um, you know, basically the Grand Orient's um, colors and stuff. But what's interesting is that the, what the apron of the Scots master was, was, was originally for, you know, people who were sitting in the East, uh, actually was listed in uh, those articles to actually become the apron of a master mason, you know. And then, so it wasn't going to be until 1808 that they corrected one of the uh, things. So originally the triple triangle with the crown on it, which was the symbol of a Scots master who was actually, you know, serving in the East, uh, they changed it to the letters MB, um, you know, and with an added, uh, a square and compass to that, you know, so that was uh, when they, the design was finalized for the Master Mason apron for the ancient and the Scottish Rite. And so when you look overseas, you know, in Europe, Africa, South America, and even like, you know, Mexico and all North America, you will see those places have those, the red aprons with them. And now the reason why we really didn't have that in Louisiana was because remember when we became codified and like 1812, it was under uh, ancient uh, masonry uh, as practiced under from Pennsylvania and South Carolina. And but and then when you go forward into like um, what happened during the Grand Consistory time frame, and also with the Grand Orient of Louisiana, Supreme Council of Louisiana, remember those um, brothers were coming out of uh, what was happening under the Grand Lodge, and then to um, you know, a lot of the practices that they were actually doing, like, like when we look at St. Andre, disciple of the uh, Masonic Senate, and even with Los Amigos that ordered, they were actually doing what would be considered uh, variants of the French Rite, you know, so I blue apron lodges, you know. So, you know, that answered like the question of like, why, even though if it's in statutes for uh, Scottish Rite to be wearing the red aprons and stuff, why that practice didn't become standard in uh, Louisiana Scottish Rite, and why, even for the past masters and stuff like that, why did that not become practice? And, you know, it's just because you had uh, Masons who were working under the notions of ancient Masonry and also in the notions of modern um, French Masonry. And so even though they were, you know, coming in and working the SR ritual, they were just doing that for initiation purposes and not for administrative purposes or uh, even in decorum and stuff, you know. So, you know, so that's like a little like tidbit of like the history, of like statutory, where does the, the red apron notion come from? And then also too, like how does that uh, tie into Louisiana Louisiana masonry and yet yeah, why did those that practices not take hold in Louisiana you know so like I said it literally goes back to 1745 and you know even in um the grand uh, consistory of Louisiana they said that they were going to uh, adopt the the statutes and regulations of the Grand Orient but they never but nowhere in the actual like literature from Louisiana that I've seen has it been that anybody actually put those into practice, you know, especially with the decorum? Like you can see at, um, say, like Etoile Portal Airlines, what, how they'll have the um, senior warden, he'll be in the west, but in the corner and stuff. And then they'll have the, um, the junior warden, he'll, he'll be situated in the center of the south and stuff. And that was basically done because originally like the lodges were set up for French right masonry. And then for, um, you know, to 
basically uh, make it into an ancient and seven Scottish right. They moved where the junior warden was, but they didn't relocate the senior warden. So he, the senior warden is stuck in the same place that he would have been in a French right situation. You know, so it's just like, you can see these compromises and how these these quick fixes were put into place. But then at this, at time, because it became inertia, that they actually, it just became the norm of what people just did as masonry. And then later on, it was written into books and published and codified that way. So you'll see that even now, even in paintings, where they'll have uh, the senior warden, instead of him being directly uh, across from the worst rule, he'll be in the corner, you know, and you'll, and so you can see that um, very interesting, uh, you know, across the world now. But, um, you know, so that's like, my, uh, you know, my presentation so far on, um, you know, the evolution of the statues and the decor of the administrators and how that devolved into the symbolic degrees. And even like, um, if you actually look at the titles used in the symbolic degrees and stuff like that, they are there are actually like Grand Lodge officers um, titles and stuff, but they devolved into the degrees themselves, you know, oh, that's it. Hey, Kevin, mm -hmm. how much of it do you have wrote down? Oh, I mean, I have it all written down, in, but it's all in French. And then I have, uh, and I actually had some papers and stuff pulled up, but, you know, I had to, like, translate it all and put it into, like, uh, you know, so, you know, and something that was digestible, you know. Yeah, I know. You're, you, you're a walking history book of file cabinet, man. You just, you just spit it right out. So, I mean, I know we're not taking questions, but I'm gonna ask you this. So is it is it kind of safe to say, and I'm gonna put you on the spot, that nobody is uh, actually practicing pure Scottish right much from what it originally started off as? Well, I would say there's, you know, because of Darwinian notions of what you would call uh, social Darwinism, I wanna say there's nothing really pure in Scottish right masonry. Because the reason why is this that if you even look at back into the Franken manuscripts, right? Mm -hmm. And you look at Balo, um, you know, the Haran Court manuscripts and stuff like that, you can see where there's grammatical errors or there's transposition errors and stuff like that. And then those errors get passed on and codified later on and stuff, you know? So, mm -hmm. So you would you can't really say like anything's like quote unquote orthodox pure or correct and stuff. It it really is just like you know survival. If it is like what um, the lodges that had survived and the masons who have survived, you know what were they able to pass on? Even if they didn't like, for instance, when you look at Franklin's uh, manuscript and stuff, he changes some of the uh, stuff in there. Um, you know, it gives like his like for instance, instead of doing like a literal French translation he like gives like a brand new English um, meaning to things and stuff, right? That don't, you know, so it's either it's like, well, did he actually have the the actual meaning explained to him and stuff? Or was, did he have like a manuscript and, you know, they he just put new meanings to initials, you know what I'm saying? So, yes. You know, like, okay. like some of the things like when they were talking about like words and like the Royal Arch and stuff like that. And you look, read them from right to left and stuff, and it look like uh, Hebrew pronouns, you know? And it's just like, okay, so did they just get a Hebrew dictionary and just start listing off, you know, you know, words that from Hebrew? And then when you look into later editions and stuff, you start seeing that, oh, they started giving like random words that don't actually mean, like for instance, Job is not a name of God. It's never been a name of God, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> so, or, you know, the same thing with like Tirson, that's not a name of God, you know? So you start seeing where it's just like, because people didn't understand the language or the manuscripts that they're reading, they just started making up stuff. All right. Uh, okay, my last question to you is, uh, I know we spoke about this earlier, and I don't know if we covered this in the last video, but either way, it's still, it's still like helpful information. When did you notice the change from the gospels to the old, you get what you get. What I'm asking, you know, the New Testament to the Old Testament, as far as God is right, make sure come, you know, the, the change. For well, so basically, 
it actually goes very early on and stuff. Because, like, for instance, if you want to talk about, like, Rose Qua, an original one, it's based off of, like, you know, a lot of New Testament readings and stuff. But then when you switched over to, um, um, when you switched over to the Scottish philosophical, right, they wanted something that was more hermetic and more aligned with, uh, you know, Old Testament, okay? So some of the meanings that, you know, give you like a literal uh, scripture from the New Testament, they give you something that's like, has nothing to do with the New Testament. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, it's, and then like, so yeah, the Scottish philosophical, right? You know, they were like the first ones to codify that. And because the Marseille uh, system was, uh, you know, the Marseille um, lodges were part of that tradition. That is what got passed on into what became the Order of the Royal Secret and also by extensia, the ancient the seven Scottish Rite, Maxis Rite, Misery, et cetera. You know, so the thing about it is that, and you also start seeing where they um, start changing the statutes. So when you look at the 1762 statutes, there's not that mention of you have to be a baptized Christian in it. You know, so all of a sudden it's like you start opening up the, the gates of who can become a Mason now, you know, by changing uh, not only like your ordinances, but also like your rituals itself. You know, and like I said, yep. that goes on back into, like I said, 1760s among some circles and then passes on forward, you know. All right. All right. Uh, I appreciate that, Brother Rogers. Well, uh, Brother Paul, you got your mic on mute. I mean, Brother Powell, you got your uh, mic on mute. I think so. All right. Well, hey, I'm the heat. I'm not taking the heat. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, I want to talk a little this evening about um, the ancient accepted Scottish Rite, but an early version of our rules and regulations. And this would be a document that is basically probably the most talked about, argued about, uh, maligned and praised, and basically today unknown document is the Grand Constitutions of 1786. Now this originally um, was a document that was the rules and regulations for the early Scottish Rite. It was how to create and operate a body of 33 degree masonry, a Supreme Council. And the claim has always been that these constitutions were approved in a Supreme Council of the 33rd degree session in Berlin in May 1st, 1786. And it was approved by none other than King Frederick II, uh, Frederick the Great. And he approved these approximately three months before his death. Now, the story continues with these constitutions, the original version of them signed by Frederick being placed on a boat and being sent to the United States. Uh, at that time, the United States was about 10 years old. But in any event, these do this document was put on this boat and apparently somewhere along the way, uh, it obtained damage, sea salt water or something, destroyed this document. However, the individuals who were bringing it over apparently had very good memories because they were able to transcribe it and give it to a group of Masons in Charleston, South Carolina. And what they did was they created in May 31st, 1801, a Supreme Council of the 33rd degree in Charleston, South Carolina. Now, when they did this, they used these grand constitutions as their authorization to create this body. And the grand lodges of that time in the United States were working out, the United States was only about 10 years old and masonry had to be completely reorganized. So they were working hard to try and figure out uh, how to create masonry 
in this country. And what they did when they heard that there was a new body of masonry, they looked at it and they basically thought that it was side degrees and it wasn't that important. And if King Frederick II approved some authorization for it, why not? Let them, let them operate like they want. So this is the way that Charleston originally operated and was created. And unfortunately, we don't have many records from the early days of uh, the Charleston Supreme Council. They're, they've been lost. But we do have uh, one thing, a document that is very important. Let me see if I can get it up here. This is uh, a document that was published in 1802. It's sometimes called the circular through the two, uh, throughout the two hemispheres. It's also known as an 1802 manifesto and also as the birth certificate of the Scottish Rite. It was a announcement bulletin that was published. And I might say it, it, uh, the entire document is a photographic reproduction of it in the Ray Baker Harris, James D. Carter, History of the Supreme Council, 1801 to 1861. This is a very important book. It's one of my favorites because this entire document is published in this book. And what it does, this document speaks, it gives a history of masonry and it's a, it's a challenged history. It's been disputed quite a bit, but it's important that it, 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 it exists and it traces masonry from the early days up until the creation of the Supreme Council in Charleston with uh, John Mitchell as the Grand Commander. It also has a, uh, another section, which is a list of degrees. So this is a very important document to uh, look at and study because it does provide some good information. But what happened was this Supreme Council organized itself and around the same time that this circular was being published, 1802, uh, a second Supreme Council was created in the Leeward Islands by one of the individuals who was involved in creating the Charleston Council, that was Alexander de Grasse Tilly. 1804, early 1804, he goes to Kingston, Jamaica, and he creates a Supreme Council there. He goes to France, in late 1804, and he creates in Paris the Supreme Council of France. So there's activity going on rather quickly, and the Supreme Council, this 33 degree system, seems to be catching on. Now, what was happening around this same time? There was an active member, a 33rd active member of this 1802 Supreme Council in the Leeward Islands. His name was Antoine Bedeau. Now he decides he's leaving and he passes by way of New Orleans. And there's no record that he did much of anything in New Orleans other than leave a register from him. But he travels on to uh, New York and he creates in New York a grand consistory of this 33 degree system. Now this was a body of 32nd degree. And then he leaves and goes to uh, France. Now, the situation in New York at this time was not an uncommon situation in masonry. Unfortunately, there was two groups. And basically, this group said masonry is this way. And this group said masonry is that way. And they didn't like each other. And they didn't dis want to have anything to do with each other. And you're wrong. No, you're wrong. So this was their attitude. Well, one of these groups was the group that Bedeau gave the Grand Consistory to. So they created this Grand Consistory. Now this other group wanted to do something. And there was an individual who came to New York by the name of Joseph Cerno. He was a deputy inspector general of this older 25 degree system, the order of the Royal Secret. Well, he got in with this other group that was in New York, this Masonic political divide. And he created bodies in New York beginning 1807 that evolved into a Supreme Council, the 33rd degree. 
Now, because these two groups didn't like each other, this grand consistory did not pass under the jurisdiction of this Cerno Supreme Council. And there's questions as to how much Cerno actually knew about this 33 degree system, because there's a lot of variances in what he had. But anyway, they are existing in New York as 33 degree system bodies, but were not friendly and they were just there. Now, there's been debate for a long time as to what uh, Charleston knew about this new developments that was taking place in New York. And for this lecture, I don't see a reason to go into much detail about that because it's all speculation. But what's not speculation is that in 1813, uh, Manuel de la Mata, who was an active member of the Charleston Supreme Council and their uh, grand treasurer, he travels to New York. It's not really known if it was because of this activity that was taking place or if it was business or vacation or what, but he travels to New York and he examines this grand consistory. Well, the grand consistory says, hey, look, this is, this is how we trace ourselves. We were created this way. And he realizes, he says, well, yeah, I, this, this guy was a active member of uh, 33rd, but nobody sh authorized him to create this body here. You're not supposed to be here. How, wh why are you here? Well, they didn't have a real answer. So he goes to visit Joseph Cerno. Well, Cerno was a, by profession, a jeweler, and he had opened up a jewelry shop in New York. So they go, De La Mata goes and pays him a visit. They talk for a while. There's no real record of what was said between the two of them. But at some point, uh, he apparently asked him, can I see your 33rd degree patent? Joseph Cerno apparently did not give him anything. Either he didn't have one, which I believe, or he didn't show it to him. And this gave cause for De La Mata to say, hi, you're a fake. You're not legitimate. You're a fraud. And he leaves. Now, again, this is not the time for this discussion because this would take it off in a long way, but there's no evidence whatsoever that Joseph Cerno had any more of a 33rd degree patent than did John Mitchell, who was the first Grand Commander of the Charleston Supreme Council. Why is for another time. But in any event, De La Mata decides to write two letters. He sends one letter to John Mitchell, who was the Grand Commander of the Charleston Supreme Council. And he sends a second letter to Frederick Delco, who was the Lieutenant Grand Commander and succeeded Mitchell at, to become Grand Commander. And he mails them both letters telling them of what he found in his opinion. While the letters are en route to Charleston, he goes back to this grand consistory and he says, you know, uh, you're not really legitimate, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna heal you. And I'm going to not only sanction your grand consistory, but out of you, I'm going to create a Supreme Council. And this is the birth of the Supreme Council of Northern Masonic jurisdiction. So he creates this Supreme Council out of them. Well, back in Charleston, John Mitchell and Frederick Delco received the letters from De La Mata and they're angry. They say, who is this guy Cerno? He doesn't have any right to create anything. He's a fraud. Both of them agreed and said the same thing. However, Frederick Delco said something very different and very interesting. And let's see if I can get that up here. He says, he writes back to Manuel de la Mata, I regret very much to find the unauthorized conduct of a certain individual in New York in establishing degrees which cannot lawfully exist in any part of the US, but in Charleston. It is well known to those who have lawfully received a 33rd degree that there can be but one council in a nation or kingdom. And that council for the US was lawfully established in this city, May 31st, 1801. So you, when you read this, 
it makes you say, well, why did he do that? And the first thing you got to think is, oops, what about Emmanuel de la Mata creating this Supreme Council of Northern Jurisdiction? There's a lot of debate. There's not a lot of information about what happened, whether uh, de la Mata acted with the knowledge of the Charleston Council or if he acted on his own or what happened. And you have to ask, was Delco speaking correctly? Did the grand constitutions and say that there was one council? Well, actually, there is uh, a little bit of evidence to support what Frederick Delco wrote. And that is in that 1802 manifesto. In that document, it says, on the 31st of May, 5801, which is 1801, the Supreme Council for the 33rd degree for the United States of America was opened with high honors in masonry. So with that, it seems like there was some argument that could be made that the grand constitution said that there was only allowed one uh, council. Didn't explain why de la Mata created one if he knew that there was only supposed to be one. But in any event, the Northern jurisdiction and the Southern jurisdiction soon mended fences if there was any problems. And both of them went to war with the Cerno Supreme Council. Well, this war was a devastating one to the Scottish Rite. And what happened was uh, so you, you would think automatically that Charleston and the Northern jurisdiction should have been able to overpower uh, this Cerno body rather quickly if they were just an irregular group that just decided to create themselves. The problem was, like I said, there were two groups in New York at the time. Cerno happened to join one group or participate with one group who happened to be the leaders of New York Masonry. In fact, the Lieutenant Grand Commander for the Cerno Supreme Council was the sitting Grand Master of the Grand Lodge in New York, DeWitt Clinton. And that influenced a lot of Grand Lodges. So when, as this war started developing and Charleston more and more started saying, well, Cerno Masonry is irregular, you know, you had the Grand Master in New York saying, hey, hang on a second, it's not exactly irregular, I'm here. And a lot of people listen to that, including Louisiana, for example. But what happened, so devastating were these attacks. And, and, and I mean, it wasn't just arguing history. It became personal. And the individuals were attacked personally. It's not just that you wrong about this, but you have something uh, you're morally corrupt. And it was a nasty fight that ended up destroying all three of these Supreme Councils. And I say destroy, it's sometimes said that they, the, the Supreme Council slumbered or they uh, ceased to be active. But the bottom line was they were not operating. And from about a 20 year period of about 1820 to the 1840s or so, uh, there was no activity in any of these three bodies. Uh, what happened during this time, uh, the, the only, the early days, the earl, only active body of high grade Scottish Rite masonry in the United States was the Grand Consistory of Louisiana. And we have to realize that also during this dormant period, 1839, the Supreme Council of Louisiana was created. So all of a sudden, uh, these Supreme Councils start waking up. And again, this is something, what happened during this time is something that deserves its own lecture. And it's too much to go into right now, but they came about and a lot of events happened. Albert Pike came on the scene in 1859 on, as Grand Commander of Southern Jurisdiction. And he was a very intelligent individual. However, he was very new to Masonry and he was being taught what the Scottish Rite was. 
uh, he didn't know a lot of the information about the Scottish Rite. And by the time that Pike came into his power, um, there was two versions of these grand constitutions that were published. One was known as the French version and the other was known as the Latin version. And there was charges, one of the, the uh, charges of forgery had come out from the beginning. Well, Pike didn't know what was what as far as any of these bodies. And he didn't know which constitutions were correct and which ones were not correct. So he looked at both of them. The French constitutions were um, basically just these 18 articles. They gave eight, one after another and they explained what the laws were. The Latin constitutions, however, gave these articles, but they also gave a lot of description about what the jewels were like, uh, the, the uh, regalia, a lot of information that was not contained in the French version. So this made Pike say, well, you know, if I'm gonna pick one of these, I'm gonna accept these Latin versions. Interestingly enough, the Northern Masonic jurisdiction, which had come back ar around, decided that they were going to accept the French version. So you have two Supreme Councils, which were in relations with each other, accepting two different versions of these grand constitutions. And what made it even more interesting was when Pike looked over these French versions, he absolutely said, this is, this is not legitimate. And he uh, made some interesting comments about it. And uh, let's see if we get it. He says, if I was satisfied that there were never any other constitutions than those contained in the French version, I should not hesitate to admit that they were a clumsy forgery and that there was nothing in the world to prove them authentic. And uh, that was pretty strong words, but that's what he felt. And so the Southern jurisdiction adopted the Latin version. In 1859, Albert Pike published the Latin version in his document, published it and accepted this as his version. Now, in the late 1860s, 1868, there was a dispute between Albert Pike and Joshua Drummond, who was the grand commander of the Northern Masonic jurisdiction. And it had to do with jurisdictional land. Northern jurisdiction wanted to expand a bit. And Pike said, no, you can't do that. You gotta get our permission first. And Joshua Drummond, he says, no, that's not necessary. He says, uh, we can expand as we want in our area. He says, this is our area and Pike they ended up, what they did was they had a letter exchange and the dispute was uh, handled in mails. And what Drummond wrote was very interesting. Uh, he says, I hold that under the constitutions of 1786, the Northern jurisdiction and the Southern jurisdiction are in every respect and for all purposes, as distinct as if they were separate nations that we, as well as you, de derive our rights of jurisdiction from those constitutions, that those constitutions create the two separate jurisdictions. Two separate jurisdictions. Now, Albert Pike, he wrote back, he says, I do not agree that the constitutions created the two jurisdictions. For the United States composed a single jurisdiction until 1813 or 1850 and might have continued to be such until today. The provision is restrictive that there shall not be more than two Supreme Councils established in the United States. That is the real meaning of it, not that there shall be two. And then he goes on to say, if illustrious brother Drummond were right in holding that the Northern part of the United States did not belong to the jurisdiction of the Southern Council, prior to 1813 or 1815, but was to vest whether it willed it or not in a Northern council, whenever one should be created there, a consequence which he does not foresee might follow. That hypothesis would have made the Northern states to have been unoccupied territory 
in which any inspector general could establish a Supreme Council and may, might thus make legitimate the Cerno Council and annihilate that created in 1813 or 1850 by De La Mata. It certainly would destroy the principal ground upon which the legitimacy of Cerno's council was always impeached, to which that the council at Charleston had jurisdiction over the whole United States and that no other council could be created anywhere in them except by its consent. Now, when I read all of this, there are two questions that I immediately come up with. The first is why did Joshua Drummond believe that there was two councils that were allowed and provided for in the grand constitutions? And the second question is for Albert Pike. You see, this is only a small portion of what Albert Pike wrote. He went into great detail analyzing the French version of the grand constitutions and arguing grammar. French grammar and how the French version did not mean there shall be two councils. And he went to numerous pages to explain this. And when you think about it, why would he do that? He had already proclaimed the French version a forgery. Why would he go to so much trouble arguing over what the French version meant? Why didn't he just pull out the Latin version and say, here, this is a legitimate one. This is what we adhere to. Well, to answer the first question, uh, Joshua Drummond did not pull this two Supreme Councils out of the air. What he did was he went to the birth certificate of the Northern jurisdiction, which was written by Emmanuel de la Mata. And it says, and whereas the grand constitutions of the 33rd degree specify particularly that there shall be two grand and supreme councils of the 33rd degree for the jurisdiction of the United States of America, one for the South and the other for the North. Well, that changes everything. That explains why he said that. But what about Pike? Why didn't he pull out that Latin version? reason was he couldn't. And the reason was the Latin version that P Pike published in 1859, Article 5, it says in the states and providences as well as mainland and islands nor whereof North America is composed, there shall be two councils, one as great a distance as may be from the other. Pike strongly argued the Latin version because, I mean, the French version, because he couldn't use the Latin version, because the Latin version said exactly what Drummond was saying. So now we, we're stuck. We also have to go back and say, why did all of this happen? Who gave de la Mata the idea that there could be two Supreme Councils? Frederick Delco, in his letter to him, said that it could only be one. And if they could be two, does this make Sir No Supreme Council legitimate? Well, in order to understand some of this, we have to understand where everything came from. Uh, the two versions both came from France. And the uh, Latin version was not seen before 1832. And it was none other than the Count Saint Laurent, who was the sovereign grand commander of the United Supreme Council of the Western Hemisphere. He traveled to France and he became a member of the Supreme Council of France. And he brought this Latin version together and he gave it. St. Laurent's Lieutenant Grand Commander was the Marquis de St. Angelo. When they realized that this United Supreme Council of the Western Hemisphere was falling apart, St. Laurent went to Paris, St. Angelo comes to New Orleans and creates the Supreme Council of Louisiana. Pike didn't realize this, but what about the French version? Where did that come from? The problem is uh, at the time of Albert Pike, there was a lot of things 
that he didn't have available. A lot of the material from the very early days weren't available to him either. And there were some documents that he didn't have available and wouldn't become available until the 1900s. One of the documents that came to light was found in the Netherlands in the early 1900s. And we have Ray Baker Harris to thank for it because it explains uh, the first French language version that was found. And what we have is uh, in his History of the Supreme Council, uh, 1801 to 1861, he writes, the French, the manuscript is in French. Now he's talking about the grand constitutions in the handwriting of Jean Delahogue with a certification by him that he made the copy from one in the archives at Charleston and translated from the English by me. What he's talking about is the grand constitutions. Delahogue went to Charleston. Now he was, Delahogue was the Lieutenant Grand Commander under uh, de Grasse Tilly, who's also his father-in-law. And he was there in Charleston when all of this was going on. Uh, he got his copy from Charleston. So what copy was in Charleston? Well, we also again have Ray Baker Harris to thank for that because uh, he published the oldest known version of the Grand Constitutions of 1786, which is in the handwriting of Frederick Delco. They estimate the date as 1802. Now this entire document is a photographic reproduction and it's in the book. And this is why I believe that this book is one of the most important books that you can get for studying the Scottish Rite because of these photographic reproductions. But article five reads, there shall be but one council of this degree in each nation or kingdom of Europe, two in the United States of America, as remote from each other as possible. So now we have some real questions. If Frederick Delco wrote this, why did he tell Emmanuel de la Mata that there can only be one? Emmanuel de la Mata must have known that they would, he could do two in order for him to create this Supreme Council. Does this mean that because Cerno followed the same procedure or possibly followed the same procedure as John Mitchell did to create a Supreme Council, it was Cerno who was legitimate and not the Northern jurisdiction. These are questions that have to be answered at some point. But for now, this discussion has to do with the grand constitutions of 1786. And right now I'm speaking for myself and no one else. Um, I believe that this old order of the royal secret had beautiful rituals, had beautiful ceremonies. The problem was that organization was terrible. One deputy inspector general would have uh, one ritual and another one would have completely different rituals. Their organization was falling apart. I believe that in the very early days of the Charleston Council, or prior to their creating that, they realized that something had to be done about these degrees. And they decided that the best way to handle it was to start something new, preserve these rituals, build on the rituals and create a system that was new, give new constitutions. And all of this worked out beautifully, but they made a mistake. They were insecure, I believe, about their ability to advance a new system of masonry. And it was kind of the, who am I? They're not gonna listen to me. They won't listen to what we're doing. And I believe that they created the story about Frederick the second, Frederick the Great. And the reason was that this was a European king giving validation to them. When Cerno came up, I believe that caught him out of left field and they were trapped by their own lie because they did not claim ownership 
of this new 33 degree system. They said the owners were Frederick and they just simply followed his guidance in how to create a Supreme Council. And when Cerno came up, they were trapped by their own lie because they, they couldn't say, hey, you stole that from me because we created it because they had already lied about the creation. And so one lie developed onto another lie. Does this mean that the Scottish right is not valid? Not at all. What I really believe is enough time has passed that we have to understand that people are human and people make mistakes. I believe these guys in the early days created something that was very valuable, but I also believe it is a mistake to believe that any human being can own a philosophy such as the philosophy of the Scottish Rite. No one owns the Scottish Rite. No one owns any aspect of masonry. The most that we can hope for is to belong to it. And this is where I believe some have dropped the ball. There are Masonic organizations which in no way, shape or form represent masonry. They exist only to take money from people. And there are others which try to teach the philosophy and try to teach the meanings, the honor, integrity, duty, justice, all that the Scottish Rite entails. And I believe that we have to look at these past situations, recognize that human beings were doing this and they made a mistake. And I believe the time has come to move on from this and start recognizing that we don't own something and we need anyone who is a true Scottish Rite Mason to be working together because I guarantee you we're in some strange times now and we need the Scottish Rite and the philosophy of the Scottish Rite, in my opinion, more now than ever. And that's the presentation. I believe the grand constitutions were not legitimate. I believe that they were created. They're wonderful, but they were lied about as to who approved them. So thank you all. And if there's any questions. All right, uh, we're going to do the questions like this. You have a button. I'm pretty sure some of y'all know how to do it is to raise your hand button. I'm going to go down. I'm going to just do it as a, you know, who has you send them. I'm going to recognize you. But uh, before they do that, now, Brother Paul, you said something that's going to probably cause a wildfire. So I'm asking you for clarification because okay. when you say nobody owns masonry, does that mean, now, I feel like I know what you mean, but for clar uh, clarification, because you know how people take stuff and run with it. Does that mean that pop-up organizations could now say, well, y'all don't own this and we can do this because we got, we have charters. And so for clarification, when you say nobody owns masonry, are you still saying that there's still rules and structure and lineage is still important, or I mean, a clear, uh, you know, elaborate on it. If uh, a group of high school kids find a ritual somewhere, or buy a ritual online, or find it, and they decide that they're gonna put on a play in high school, and they put on a ritual, and it's a master mason degree, they may have done everything that's in there, but there is more to being a Mason than simply words on a piece of paper. And there's more elements into an initiation than what is really realized. And when I say no one owns Masonry, I mean that no one owns the philosophy and no one can, you can't own a philosophy that has been around since the beginning days of time you can belong to that philosophy and one individual who understands the philosophy will recognize another person who has that same philosophy and they'll say, yeah. But yes, in the organization of masonry, there has to be rules and regulations. And these rules and regulations have to be followed until they're found out that they're not best interest of the organization. This was uh, in Prince Hall with Prince Hall Masonry in the United States, there was for years, Prince Hall Masonry was considered irregular. Was it? Well, no, it really wasn't. There was reasons, but they had this rule that you could only have one Grand Lodge in the state. 
And they finally realized, well, no, this is not correct. These are all legitimate Masons. And when you find a legitimate Mason, and that does not mean a Mason who just sits there to collect money from dues and doesn't give anything to his members, that's con artists. But a legitimate body of Masons that teach masonry and teach the philosophy of Freemasonry, they ought to be looked at and they ought to be looked at closely to understand their lineage, their, what they do, if they are part of the philosophy of Freemasonry. That's what I mean. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, because you know, you know how you know how some internet, you know, some of these internet brothers are they gonna take that in, man. It, it'll be all over the internet tomorrow. Yeah, all I gotta do that. is ask me. <laughs> yeah, I got you. I got you. Okay, that's just for right now. I don't want to mess up your last name, but I know we have brother Eddie. He has a question. Uh yes, Eddie LaBeouf. Thank you, um, Brother Robertson. Uh if I can, I'd like to start off and I just want to thank um Brother Eddie Gabriel, most powerful, and um Louisiana Supreme Council. Um, I recently was elected as worship master of Etoile Polaire, number one, that we keep talking about, and the as venerable master of, of the Valley of New Orleans. And the Louisiana Supreme Council sent me a letter congratulating me and offering support. And I really appreciate that um, Brother Gabriel did that. And also it was signed by um, Brother Kermit Robinson, uh, who has a very interesting signature. If you've never seen his signature, it's a very interesting signature. But I want to thank Louisiana Supreme Council. I count this letter among my most valued treasures that I, I've received over the years in Freemasonry, and I am going to be framing it. Uh, I just wanted to add something to Kevin Rogers um, about Etoile Polaire. Uh, yes, our, our senior warden is in the Northwest corner, if anybody's ever been there. Um, and a lot of us believe that the junior warden was indeed in the Southwest corner and was later moved, as Kevin mentioned, uh, to the South, which is the more traditional position for the junior warden. Uh, but if you, uh, and I know, Kevin, I know you've been to Etoile before, but I, I believe and I've always believed the reason our senior warden is still in the corner is not because they, they had a conscious decision, but at Etoile Polaire, we only have one giant door in the middle. So if we were to try to put the senior warden across from the worship master, uh, he would actually be blocking the, the entrance way. So I think if they could have moved the senior warden they would have like they did the junior warden, but I think it was more of a practical reason. They couldn't do it. That's my opinion. I can't prove that. What do you, what do you think about that, Kevin? Um, I know it's been a while since you've been there. Yeah, I agree. And that's why I said that it was a, a inertia thing because when you go into like De, uh, Delaunay and the Williams and then Ragon's like a Tyler book and their rituals, mm -hmm. they actually say the senior warden is going to be in the North uh West, you know, yeah. so all this, and that's but it's kind of funny that uh, Abraham's uh, where Abraham got his uh, ritual, uh, Risley from uh, the grass Tilly, and he says that the senior wilderness is in the south. So you see that, like, in the earlier ones, they originally had it exactly like you're supposed to have an ancient craft masonry, but because of like Etoile Polaire and Lodges who converted over. That they all of a sudden made that provision that now we're going to start putting it in the northwest, and then so that became the norm across the world, you know. Yeah. Yes, and uh, the only thing I'd mentioned too uh, earlier, Brother Robertson mentioned about uh, the idea of pure Scottish Rite masonry. I feel like, you know, uh, for those who don't know, the 16th Masonic District for us um, is the ten lodges that practice Scottish Rite masonry. Even among us, our lodges are allowed to have variations in the ritual so how we do it can be a little bit different from how germania lodge does it for instance or even how uh, a little different from Cervantes. so i feel like from the beginning and, and maybe michael and uh Kevion would think different i think from the beginning the scottish right never really felt a need to standardize so because of that i, I think you had this situation where you didn't really have a pure ritual because um, it, everybody was doing their own thing. Now, what, what do y'all think about that? Um, okay, well, so uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. The the problem was in uh, 1850, the uh, Grand Lodge changed, and all Scottish Rite lodges were told to turn in their charters, and there was a desire to have one ritual, one language, 
and it, it fell apart. There was a revolt and there was a lot of stuff. And the concession that was given was that uh, certain lodges could work the Scottish Rite ritual. However, the Grand Lodge would not interfere with their ritual. Now, the 16th district has always felt that this means the Grand Lodge doesn't have the right to interfere with the ritual. But the fact of the matter is the Grand Lodge was basically saying you're on your own. Mm -hmm. And what I believe is that uh, we had three right rituals uh, and we keep forgetting about that French right. And you see French right influence in uh, Etois Palais. You see it in Germania, you see it in a number of places. And I believe it was a combination of the fact that the Grand Lodge didn't supervise rituals like it did with the York Rite Lodges, with the lecturers and translation issues, translating mm -hmm. for five different languages, eventually down to one, uh, maybe one and a half now, if, if Cervantes is, is moving more towards Spanish. But, uh, and also the fact that these lodges were not being supervised, so they had, you know, if, if they made a mistake, the mistake would be carried on, or if they deliberately did something. Uh, so there's, I think there was a combination of, of reasons. Uh, I don't believe it was the intention initially prior to 1850 for the lodges to work um, independently because they had the, the uh, Chamber of Rites, which supervised the rituals of all three rites. So I think it's a combination of things. Okay. That's all I have. Thanks. Do we have any more questions? Only Brother Eddie LaBeouf was the only one to raise his hand. On, no, I don't see any more hands. So let me ask you this, Brother Paul or uh, Kevin, you can uh, you can chime in. When you say nobody owns the philosophy of Freemasonry, so where do you believe, as far as you know, your own personal opinion, that this kinetic is between? Scottish right with other Scottish right organizations or Scottish right and York right. Why is it masonry? Uh, he gone. I call, give me one second. Uh, where do you think the disconnect is? Why masonry is not viewed as this one universal family, or why is it that you have something that feel that their right is the only right in masonry? And I got you. It, the, there's, there's you know what I'm saying. One right owns it, and you're. They'll call you their cousin or like a half brother. I mean, it's just why do you feel like where's the disconnect and what where do you feel like started that? Well, Kivian, you want to say something or you want me to? All right. So yeah, I mean, but all right, let's go go back to let's say the 1740s, right? So remember in 1744 when Claremont became the Grand Master. He was like, oh, I know that there's a Scott Master degree, but we're not going to recognize it. And then he flips the scripts like literally a year later. So the thing about it is that you get these people start writing new degrees, right? And all of a sudden you get thousands and thousands of degrees. And then on top of that, the Blue Lodge or symbolic degrees are supposed to be an oral tradition, right? So all of a sudden you start getting thousands of lodges. And, you know, if you've ever played the game Telephone, you know, everybody's going to have their own little nuances. And then when you start not only going to regional dialects and different languages and then different ideologies, you start seeing these, like, for instance, the right of the strict observance that comes out of that same 1740s time period of for Scott's master. And he starts adding in, like, you know, the, the boat with the, the sail broken, you know, and a broken stone and you know, all of these little changes where the it's the original, still original blue degrees, but he starts adding in more Templarism or more symbology. And then all of a sudden that breaks over into the rectified Scottish Rite and he added in his Martinism to it and stuff. So you see every, these people, they had their own ideologies and they wanted to impute that into what the, um, the craft is about. And then when you get to like the Louisiana, uh, you know, ritual, it's very humanistic and it, it goes into like anthropological view of what the tools are and what masonry is about. And it's very different from then what you will find in the French tradition, where it's more about the works and days of labor, you know? So you, so you can see is that 
like you like like goes back to the social Darwinism, you know, so uh, survival of the fittest. People had these traditions, and you know, whatever lodges survived, those are the ones whose traditions kept thriving and going forward. And then also, and that's also why you see in early masonry, uh, even going back to the first Grand Lodge with De Sagulier, where it's just like, oh, we need to get these very notable people who have uh, famous names and they got money so that they can keep these organizations going. Because if you get a group of poor people, you know, or people who are not literate, then they don't write down uh, what they're doing. So all of a sudden is that way either get lost because of a fire or a flood or disease like yellow fever, you know, and it, their whole tradition goes out the window. Like, for instance, the Cervantes rituals and stuff. You know, if those uh, rituals weren't published in, in, in books and spread around the world, you know, we may have never known about what Los Amigos del Orden was doing or, you know, what Covadonga, also named as De Castro, was doing and how he influenced Mexico and Cuba, you know, and, uh, and Latin America in general. You know, and so you have to see is that even with him and stuff, he wrote his own ritual and stuff. So even while there is based off of French antecedents and stuff, you know, everybody put their own stamp about what is Scottish Rite Masonry. And then when you start getting into the concept of sovereignty and every ju uh, jurisdiction being distinct, it almost devolves into like a congregationalist uh, modality of administration that you'll find in like low church Protestantism, where it's the congregation or the presbyters, you know, at the local level who decide uh, what's going on in mainstream and what's going on in that lodge or that church, you know, versus a more high church, you know, Episcopal where like in the Scottish Rite or, you know, Grand Masters and stuff where it's dictated from on high, you know? And so that's why you see these com um, competing lineages and these competing ideologies, you know, like Sweden's boards or even the French Rite died off, you know, and they had to keep rewriting and adding new rituals and they want to claim that it's the same thing that they've been doing since the 1770s, but you can literally just read the ritual and know that's not true, you know? So, you know, that's what's, that's what's really going on. And the, the, the issue with quote unquote purity of philosophy happens when all of a sudden the thesis changes, right? Because like, for instance, when, you know, the thesis say like Desert Tons or Chemin, Duponte, and they're like, oh, it's purely an astrological or astronomical phenomena, or it's based off of like uh, St. Augustine's and, you know, what creates sin and avarice, you know, and you start in putting that ideology into the ritual, then all of a sudden the underlying teachings start changing, you know? So while the modality of the working may be very familiar, what they're actually instructing you and instilling you it'd be totally different. So then the question is, is like, are you really still teaching the Masonic philosophy at that point? You know, or same thing with um, some of the co-Masonics, uh, like LaJoy Human, who added St. Germain and that hermetic tradition into their ritual. Like for instance, they put like a, a light, I mean, like a red light or something on their altar to signify St. Germain. So all of a sudden you had that same influence where they start putting in other traditions and laying them onto the craft that they're no longer doing, you know, what's considered ancient masonry. Brother Paul, you want to say something? Well, in addition to what uh, Kivion said, um, when Freemasonry was created in the United States, um, they had to start over from scratch and they came upon this idea a decision that there was going to be one grand lodge per state, one ritual, and one language. And this, I believe if you look at that 1802 manifesto of the uh, Charleston Supreme Council, they list the degrees, the craft degrees are listed. I believe that they traded their craft degrees for existence. I believe that uh, what happened did happen was there were two grand lodges in South Carolina and they were told that they need to uh, merge because they were only going to recognize one grand lodge. Both of them were considered regular, but they only wanted one grand lodge in that state. And they ended up 
you know, merging for a week or two and then splitting apart and, you know, you guys know, balance of the Grand Lodge said, we told you. And so they recognized one Grand Lodge and the other one was out in the cold until for 20 some odd years till they eventually merged again. But I believe that the Charleston Supreme Council was coming, being created around this time. And they said, ah, nobody's going to accept us if we have craft lodges. And that was the reason the Scottish Rite became viewed as an appendant body rather than a Masonic rite that begins in the EA degree and concludes in whatever degree it goes in as the York rite does. And I believe it was this belief in the United States that only a Grand Lodge can control craft lodges. That was the reason behind the Scottish rite and one of the reasons why. And interestingly enough, um, it was the Southern jurisdiction and there's a rejoinder uh, De La Mata's rejoinder, where he says that the Southern jurisdiction gave up their craft lodges with the exception that should ever the need arise for them to retake the Scottish right, they reserve that right. And that's an interesting statement. I think that that was a statement that the Supreme Council of Louisiana, because when the Supreme Council of Louisiana was created, they did not have craft lodges. It wasn't until three lodges left the Grand Lodge and said, please take us in. That was at Pelea, Los Amigos de Lauden, and uh, Disciples of Masonic Senate. They said, we're being told that we're being not allowed to work our ritual. That's when the Grand Lodge, uh, I mean, the Supreme Council began working in craft degrees and they use this rejoinder as their reason for doing it. So I believe that there's, there's a belief in the United States and it's a deep belief that only Grand Lodges can have craft lodges. And there's not a realization yet that there can be two systems or multiple systems where masonry begins as all Masonic rites do with the EA degree and concludes with whatever system it has. But that's why I believe that the Scottish rite is relegated to an appendant body status, in my opinion. All right, I mean, I have a few more questions about that, but Brother Omar, he had his hand up. I'm going to let him have the floor. Good, good evening. Hi, how are you? Thank you very much for the, for the allow me to speak. Uh, Brother Paul, Brother Rogers, uh, Brother Robinson, nice to see you all. Uh, actually, I promised myself not to speak tonight. I was only here to listen, but... Uh, the, the, the thing that just, the speaker who, who went before me, the brother, he just let me thinking uh, uh, over and over. Brother, I'm, 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 I am sorry, I'm going to butcher his name here, La Bouffe, Le Bois. Uh, what he says about the uh, de Polaire, that having, having the, the senior warden first in front of, of, the, of the master, if I understood correctly, but because of the door, because the door is in the middle of the of the center for the lodge room, it has to be moved on as the French right to the corner. So that is something that is very simple, uh, a very simple explanation, and something uh, that I've been looking for it in Mexico over the years. As I know, everybody, in, well, many people know, I've been studying Mexican ritual and is completely. Uh, Mexican ritual is a son or the grandson of Louisiana ritual. And now it gets, I just got the insight that because of Etoile de Polaire, all the Mexican lodges, pretty much 90% of the Mexican lodges are styled, styled like that. Okay. They have the same disposition like Etoile de Polaire. But this is made even after I, I mean, way after the, the, the Mexican lodges start, start, started to, to build up and expand in, in 1930, approximately. So I was looking why they are styled like that. I mean, it doesn't make sense in the Mexican uh, point of view because uh, by that time there were a, a dispute between Mexican and George Masons. But now I, ca I can see, actually, I can see it is because it was the polar. So, so thank you, brother. I got to go. <laughs> Thank you very, thank you very much. I mean, you just gave me a very oh, great. I like it. Thank you very much, brethren, and thank you for for allowing me to speak.
Yeah. I mean, just to be clear, um, I, I don't, I'm not saying that um, the senior warden is there because the door was there. I think they had to leave them there when they tried to Americanize in New York. Yeah, okay, I see you shaking your head. Yeah, I think they had to leave them there because they had to, but uh, we don't have an inner and outer door, just one big one you know, right there. So, yeah, but thank you, Omar. Are there any more questions? Or uh, Brother Powell or Brother Rogers, would y'all like to further elaborate on it? I, I agree with, with this, that it, it makes perfect sense as to why, but there's another feature. Now, one of the things you can't do in any online uh, venue is talk ritual. However, there's a certain aspect in Etoile Pelaire's furniture as you walk in that was copied by Germania Lodge. And it's clearly French rite. It's not York rite and it's not Scottish rite. It's a French rite feature. And it was copied by Germania exactly the same way. And I, I traced it back when I first saw it. And, and I, I went back and forth between Etoile Polaire and Germania. I said, well, that's exactly the same. And it's clear it was an old carryover from the French rite because Etoile Polaire at, at one time they held three charters. They held a Scottish Rite Charter, a York Rite Charter, and a French Rite Charter. They eventually, we don't know how it happened because all the proceedings during those years somehow disappeared, but all of a sudden they ended up with just the Scottish Rite Charter. And uh, it, 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 um, it's an interesting aspect of Etoile Polaire, and it's, it's, it's reason why a lot more has to be studied on all, all these old lodges. I'm sorry, can I ask another question? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Does any lodges in the 16th district in Louis in New Orleans, do they have the, okay, we know in, and I'm not saying anything that I shouldn't say, it. I mean, this is, everybody knows that, that they are the perfect Ashler, the rough Ashler, and the Trestle board. But we know that there is another jewel, which is the pointy, the perfect, uh, the, the perfect Asler with a pointy, pointy end. The, the Blotcher Torno, I think, is a name. I, I think is is called. Do any lodge in in New Orleans have that jewel, the the perfect Asler, ended with a pointy stick, with a, with a pointy end? Mm, not ringing a bell. No, not really. It's not ringing yeah. a bell. Um, yeah, the um, yeah, you know, the little obelisk looking one. You know, the uh, the perfect answer to a point or gross journal. Yeah, yes. that's not like it's mentioned in the Cervantes, but we don't actually because we don't have our own lodge. You know, so we don't actually have that on any, you know, in physical manifestation. If that makes sense, you know. But you know, it's actually it's in writ it's in writing, but. It, I don't remember any lodges actually having that, uh, you know, in, in reality, if that makes sense. Okay, um, thank you. I, I don't know um, what Michael was referring to, but um, it's not a secret for me to share this. This is the, um, um, this is our altar and our, our lights that we have at Etoile Polaire. Um, as you can see, we have nine lights instead of the traditional three. And it's kind of the three tri triads are kind of arranged and it's kind of an older form. And for some reason we have a seven sided altar. I do not know why it's seven sided, but it is strange. But um, this is our altar setup at Etoile Polaire. And it's not, not a secret, um, you know. Do you have a shot looking from the east to the west? Uh, I don't know. Let me, I'll get, give a second to talk amongst <laughs> yourselves. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> So, Brother Powell, where do we start with educating? Uh, where do we start with the education as far as teaching brothers that that masonry is more so like a, a a big a big tree with many branches than it just being a certain. You, you get what I'm saying? Just 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 one right because, like I said, the labels and the and the bickering and the fighting and the you know just the separation. 
I mean, that, to me, that's kind of like, that's not true brotherhood. So, I mean, where do we start with that? I started doing just that 40 plus years ago. All I can tell you is that every time anyone stands up and teaches something, it helps. You do things like, just like this event here, uh, I've written books, I've written papers, I've, I've, I've done as much, I think a lot of the stuff, I see young guys coming in and they start writing things and they, they this is this is the way you do it. You take it and you run with it. If something is true, you teach it and you pass it on. And it's only by teaching and passing on everybody individually is it going to eventually be realized as, 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 as something that's Masonic. And that's, that's the only thing I can say. There's no, you can't take a pill and all of a sudden change. Gotcha. Uh, I want to do a twist. How do you feel about that, brother, Eddie LaBeouf? What's that um, exactly? About far as uh, just masonry being a big tree with many branches and that we teach that it's more to masonry than just one right or two rights, you know. But the, the, I feel like the I think we missed the mark of the objective is to be a true brother, regardless what rights you choose. You get what I'm saying? I yeah. feel like as long as your lineage pans out and, and you went through the right the rightful way of doing it, I mean... I mean, but how do you feel about far as education and, and unifying? I, I look forward to it. Um, I, I, I remember a couple of years back, uh, there was a resolution. Um, the way it was written, it was to, it was something like, whereas there were three Grand Lodges in Louisiana and, and yada, 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 you know, the resolutions are. And it was like one resolution to recognize, I believe, PHA, PHO, and I believe also there's a King George Grand Lodge in Louisiana. And I thought it was strange that they would use one resolution to recognize three different organizations as though they were all the same. Uh, I, I don't know who was the author at that time. And I had actually had just started getting back into masonry after many years. Um, I think the author should have made three separate resolutions and maybe it would have had a better chance. I do think things are getting better. And I think um, we're, we're getting to where um, we're ready for unification. Um, you know, um, I mean, uh, Kevion belongs to Cervantes. Um, I actually conferred his Mark Master degree, which is one of the York Wright degrees um, in Houma, Louisiana. Um, back then, he had to leave right after he was working a, a, a job. And, um, you know, I recently um, uh, got to meet a lot of uh, Peach um, A. Masons from uh, Leesville. Um, there's uh, Lamar Howard's on this call. And, um, uh, him and several of the brothers from, I think it's called Pride of Leesville, are petitioning my Oddfellows um, organization, and they're going to be uh, independent order of Oddfellows as well. And I'm looking forward to going to Leesville uh, for their degree work. So I think the more we're doing stuff like this, the, the more um, it blends, the more the old guard that is still around that is holding out on, on and stop putting the brakes on unification. Uh, I think it's going to go away. I think now it's almost to a point of it's a matter of, of, of administratively. It's separate organizations now. Uh, I don't think it's as much um, a race thing anymore. I think it's more of an administrating. It is separate organizations. But I'm hoping we, like other states, will get to that stage. I'm looking forward to sitting with you all, for sure. Now, I do have to say this. I'm not asking these questions to put on this video to try to you know have some you know you know people are trying to twist this saying oh there you go trying to you know push you know get them to say you're regular but i was asking because of what brother paul said about the uh, people feel like they own in the philosophy of masonry when uh and i mean we seen the first video that i struggle with questions because i mean most of my questions are ritualistic because we we speak so freely as mason amazing so i don't even want to go that route but uh, do we have any more questions? Well, I do want to take the time to say uh, I do appreciate everybody for tuning in, and I do appreciate our two speakers, brother, brother Michael Powell and brother Kevion uh, Rogers. And I also want to say, uh, so I was reading this message. Most powerful, he uh, had to work tonight, and he uh, was unable to attend physically again, but 
he did send his thank yous and his and his gratitude for everybody, all the support and the love. And uh, if I could pick a day that fits his schedule, you know, he'll be able to tune in and speak. But um, I guess what uh, brother Paul, what did we decide on for the next one? It was a slumber. What was it? I'm not sure we did decide. <laughs> yeah, I, I like the uh, what was the idea? It was the uh, the slumber, the slumber years. Yeah, that's, the slumber that's, years. that's a good that's a good next step. But yes, it's up yeah. to you. It's up to y'all. Well, no, hey, I, I like I like the direction this is going. You know, we didn't we didn't bounce ideas off each other, but I'm trying to make sure that the videos connect. Um, I think we're doing what, about a five part series. Whatever you want. Yeah, we're gonna do a five part series and then we'll start introducing uh some of our videos from some of my members. But uh I just thank brother illustrious brother uh, Eddie Gabriel Jr. for uh, allowing us to be together and uh bring and allow and you know giving us the platform. And I like I said once again, I appreciate all the brothers and, and the sisters and everyone that's in attendance. Uh y'all have a blessed day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yes, sir. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Oh, yeah, this will be on YouTube and we will be sharing the video. Give me about Thank a you, day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.